Welcome to the Smart Business Revolution. 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 Do you want a revolution? Yeah. You say you want a revolution. Revolution. The revolution. It's going on right now. Welcome to The Revolution, the Smart Business Revolution podcast, where we ask today's most successful entrepreneurs to share the tools and strategies they use to build relationships and connections to grow their revenue. Now, now, your host for The Revolution, John Corcoran. All right, welcome everyone. John Corcoran here. I'm the host of this show, and you guys know that I interview a variety of different entrepreneurs, founders, CEOs, and I unpack the background, the history, the relationships that got them where they are today. And, you know, about 10 years ago, I discovered this medium, what we're doing here, podcasting. I've been doing it ever since because I get to talk with great people, not only people that I've never met before, but you even get to reconnect with people that maybe you knew often in an earlier life. And that's an example of who I'm interviewing today. We have some history going back that was instrumental in my career, and I'm gonna tell you about it in a second. But first, before we get into that, I wanna give a quick shout out, as I often do in this show, to someone who I haven't talked to in a while, but I should reconnect with him. His name is Mark Maxwell Smith. He was quite a mentor to me for a, a period of time in my college years. He was the founder of a DreamWorks game show that I worked on in college. And he is the reason that I'm introducing today's guest, interviewing today's guest. His name is Mark Summers. And, you know, if you walk down any street in America, you'll find all kinds of people will come up and say hello to him because he's a very recognizable face. He was host for many years of the long running Food Network show Unwrapped, and which I showed that he, a, a position that he had for 11 years. He's also host, hosted the next Food Network star, Ultimate Recipe Showdown, many specials for the, the channel. He also executive produced a number of different shows, including Dinner Impossible, Food Feuds, Restaurant Impossible. But many will also remember him as the former host and producer of Nickelodeon's Double Dare and What Would You Do, which I knew him from originally many, many years ago. And I was a big fan of his back then. He's also been known for his appearance with Burt Reynolds on The Tonight Show with Jay Leno, which I'll ask him about in a moment, and uh, a number of other different gigs over the years. He's had a long career in the entertainment industry, which I have many family members who are in the entertainment industry. and I know that that is no easy thing to do. So a big prop to props to Mark for coming on the show. Mark, I'm so excited to have you here. Thank you, sir. It's good to reconnect after all these years. When was Majority Rules? I don't even remember how, how many years Majority ago. Majority Rules was, I want to say, summer of 1995. <laughs> and it was uh, what was really cool about it is, you know, I say to people that DreamWorks was kind of like the Tesla of its day. It yeah. was the hot company at the time, at that time. You know, it didn't have many projects at that time, actually. And, and Majority Rules was one of its first projects that they did, that they embarked on. And I remember, you know, it was just such a cool experience. We were on, speaking of The Tonight Show, we were on the old Tonight Show stage. Do you remember that? I do. I absolutely do. It was, I was, I, that was a thrill for me because I grew up wanting to be a stand-up comedian, watching Johnny every night, and to be performing on that stage was was rather cool. Yeah, it was an interesting thing because uh, the problem with that whole project that we did is Steven Spielberg wanted nothing to do with it. And um, because of that, you know, they pleaded with him, just get in an airplane, take the show under your arm, tell station owners that they should put it on. And because you're Steven Spielberg walking into their station, they'll do it. But he wanted to make movies and the whole TV division was not interesting to him. And I think if Steven got behind it, something would have happened. But sadly, we were on in two markets. We were on in Phoenix, Arizona and New Orleans, and they were spending a fortune. We were, if you remember this, flying the audiences in from those states uh, and those cities uh, to be participants. And we were writing questions based on New Orleans or based on Phoenix, depending on what we were doing. And the whole thing was absurd when you think about it. And they spent bazillions of dollars and uh, went nowhere. It's funny because, I mean, it, it, had, it had moments of genius, you know, and one of the cool things about working on that show that summer is that it was evolving and changing. And, you know, Mark, the other Mark, Maxwell Smith, um, to his credit, was constantly trying different things to make it work. And I remember he would come out some days 
and and then in the common area and he'd grab a bunch of us staff like the accountants <laughs> he'd grab the pas and he'd say okay we're going to try a different version of the show you stand up there you're one of the contestants and he'd just try it a different way and just see if it worked or not i thought it was yeah, so cool by the way that wasn't his choice that, that was management too many cooks in the you know in the kitchen trying to tell him what to do i'll tell you a, a story that i love from that show uh jeffrey katzenberg uh was involved uh needless to say because he was involved with the initial part of dreamworks and uh, everybody was scared to death of Katzenberg. Uh, the one thing that I've realized in my career is I'm not scared of anybody. And uh, I try not to get intimidated by no matter who you are. We're all just people. We put on our clothes the same way. And I'm not going to let you dictate to me just because supposedly you're this big wig. So I was at the uh, uh, office one day. We weren't shooting. I forget. I was picking up a check or came to see Mark or something. And Katzenberg was there. And we had just shot, uh, me and Arthel Neville was the co-host of the show, shot some promos that that. I, I really didn't enjoy doing. I thought they were trying to be so creative, they were stupid. And so they were still editing at NBC, and Katzenberg grabbed me by the arm and said, come with me. I want you to watch these with me. So I went in the room, and we watched three or four of them, and he looked at me and said, what do you think, and be honest with me? And I said, they suck. <laughs> and he said, I agree, but tell me why they suck. And I explained to him my point of view as to why we weren't getting the point across about what the show is and what we were doing. We were standing on this teeter-totter. It was, made no sense. And so he said, thank you very much for being so honest. And I left. And when I left, all the other executives from DreamWorks and Mark Maxwell Smith were there. And they said, come in my office, come in my office. I, okay. They said, uh, what happened? I said, well, he pulled me in and he asked me what the promos were like and, and uh, wanted to know my true opinion. He said, well, what did you tell him? I said, they sucked. And he went, oh, my God, don't, don't, don't tell me you told him that. I said, well, he told me to be honest. And I was honest. And you know what? Katzenberg and I, after that, we got along fabulously because he knew I was going to be honest. And I wasn't going to kiss his ass. And I think that's a key to an important part of the entertainment industry. Don't tell these people what they want to hear. Uh, tell them the truth. And in the long run, I think that works out for you. That is a great lesson. And I want to ask, you know, do you think that that is part of the reason that you've had, you know, such a long running stints at different networks? Nickelodeon, you had a great relationship for many years. Food Network, you had a great relationship for many years. You know, I've been I worked a little bit in the entertainment industry after I graduated from college and my brother has for a lot of years. My dad has for a lot of years. I know there's a lot of, you know, uh, not so fun, nice people in the industry. So, yeah. so you're doing something right. If these if these networks um, have brought you back for more and more projects, what do you think is the reason that you've had such long relationships with these networks? You know, I can tell you the yin and the yang of that. Um, I started Nickelodeon and everybody there was, was new. They were trying to figure out step one, step two, step three, and they had had a lot of failures and Double Dare was a really first big success and we're what put them on the map. And so after we shot for a couple of years in Philadelphia, and then we shot New York for a season, then back to Philly, we moved down to the Nickelodeon studios in Orlando, Florida. And they asked me if I wanted to be the, uh, tech producer. And I didn't even know what that meant. I said, sure. And so I learned basically on Nickelodeon's dime how to hire, fire, edit, everything. And so um, I was getting ready to do a special. We were doing uh, the fifth a year anniversary of Double Dare. And um, we were having a production meeting, and this girl said to me, uh, okay, well, uh, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I need a teleprompter because um, in order for me to, you know, say the script, I'm not going to memorize a half hour. We need prompter. And she said, well, we can't afford that. And I said, why? And she says, because we need a prompter for each camera. And I said, yeah. And she said, well, I need five operators. If we have five cameras, I need five operators. That's not true. One person operates all the teleprompters. Well, she got into a pissing match with me. And no matter what I said, she was standing firm. She was this young kid telling me after being in the business for a hundred years that I didn't know what the hell I was talking about. Okay. So all hell broke loose. And the next thing I know, the president of the network, Jerry Laybourne and Jeffrey Darby and all the people who ran the place in New York found out that I was having this screaming match with this employee. And they flew down that night and said, we'll meet you for breakfast first thing in the morning. And so this was Nick's studios year one. And they said to me, you're here to teach these people how to do television. And I said, no, I'm not. I said, if I want to teach television, I'll go get a job at NYU or Emerson in Boston or any university. Uh, you need to hire people to know what they're doing because otherwise I don't want to do this. And, you know, I don't like people telling me what it is I'm supposed to be doing uh, if they're not doing their job on the other end. And I love Jerry Laybourne and I love Jeffrey Darby and I loved all those people. But the Nick Studios were an experiment uh, in the making and they were going non-union. 
and they were hiring people. I remember the first day we were shooting there, the audio guy had never done TV audio. He was a roadie uh, with rock and roll bands, and he holds the microphone. He looks at it. He goes, uh, you probably know how to do this better than me. And he asked me to put the microphone on. And so somehow we got through all those days. But if you hired me to be a producer and talent, I'm not here to teach you how to do it. And um, that caused some animosity. Obviously, we kissed and made up because I was there from 86 to 94 and it all went really well. But I think it's important. Uh, Rachel Ray told me something really important once, and it's never left me. Um, she said, when you're going to do a job interview, you should interview that person as much as they're interviewing you. Because if you can't learn from them and go to the next level, then you don't want to work there. And that's stuck in my head. And I agree with her 150%. That's great advice. Let's go back a little bit further because you, one of your big, I love asking people about their big breaks. And a lot of times I think in retrospect, um, we like to think that there's, it's just like a stroke of luck. And oftentimes if you unpack it, there's more to it than that. So you were a CBS, you were a page for CBS and you got an opportunity one day to um, you'd be an announcer on a, on a show, right? After having been a page, but that doesn't usually happen that way. It's not like they, they grab a page and like, go ahead, right? It's your turn, you know? So it was a weird thing. First yeah. of all, I have a phrase that I live by and it's true. The, the harder you work, the luckier you get. Okay. Things don't just happen magically. And so the story that day was Mark Smith, again, uh, integral part in both of our lives, normally did the warmups on Joker's Wild. And uh, something happened at his house and he couldn't show up. So somebody from Jack Berry's production company ran downstairs to the Pages Lounge, where I just happened to be sitting that day, and they said, the warm-up guy for Joker's Wild can't be here. Is anybody here that has any theater experience? I raised my hand. They said, get your ass up there. <laughs> and so I ran up there, and I did the warm-ups on Joker's Wild that day. Well, so it ended up, Mark Smith started to really explode in his career, and he couldn't do everything. And so he went to work for Ralph Edwards on a show called Truth or Consequences and many other things. And they needed somebody to take that job. And because I had done, you know, one of those under my belt and apparently did a good job, I therefore got hired uh, to do the rest of that season. So, you know, right place, right time. But I can tell you other situations where you have to make the moments work. For a while, I was a stand-in on a TV show called Soap on ABC. And I did that for an entire season, was on many times behind the scenes, never any lines, but, you know, eating in a restaurant or just background silliness. And I noticed that the warm up guy wasn't doing particularly well. And so I put that in the back of my head and I had started to do warm ups more and more. I was working on a TV show called Alice and I was working on Star Search and various other shows. And um, I called Tony, now cold call, Tony Thomas and uh, Paul Witt and Susan Harris were the exec producers. So I called. Uh, Tony Thomas. Why he took my phone call to this day, I have no idea. And I said, hi, my name is Mark. Uh, I've been an extra, uh, but I also do warm-ups. And I noticed your warm-up guy isn't doing a very good job. Uh, are you thinking of making any changes? And he said, well, as a matter of fact, we're, we're thinking about that. He said, you know, we're doing a run-through this Friday. Why don't you come in and do the run-through? If we like you, we'll give you the season. If not, have a nice life. So I went in there, made an opportunity happen, killed. And for the next four years, I was the warm-up guy on soap. Wow. Now that opened up all sorts of doors because Soap at the time was the hottest sitcom in the country. And other shows started to hear about the show and they would come and see me. Now, at the time, there were three studios back to back to back. To the left of me, they were doing Barney Miller. The warm up guy was some young comic by the name of David Letterman. <laughs> <laughs> to the right of me, there was a show called Bosom Buddies. And there was a young comic over there by the name of Bob, Bob Saget. Wow. So Saget, Letterman, and Summers were all doing warm-ups on these three TV shows hmm. with studios that were back to back to back. Once soap became hot, all of a sudden I was getting phone calls like crazy, and I started to pick up warm-ups. And in fact, Gary Shandling was doing the warm-up on Alice, and they didn't like him, and I ended up going in and replacing Shandling because of the success I had on soap. So I got to be known as the king wow. of warm-ups. I was working six days a week, making six figures back when I didn't even think that was possible asking people where they were from. But the reality of it was that got very tired, boring, and old. And I didn't want to be behind the scenes. I wanted to be in front of the camera. And therein, the problem was lying. And I had to figure out how to get in front instead of behind. I love Gary Shandling, but you know, to, to give the energy to a crowd and doing warm-up is a different <laughs> set of skills, I would think. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't really see him as a warm-up guy. I want to ask you, so Mark Maxwell Smith, hilarious guy you know i mean in me and i saw him warm up audiences many times and he just amazing skill at it how do you step in 
to a role like that and be yourself. And now you've had a lot of experience. You, you obviously, you, you'd done um, work at the Improv, Magic Castle. So it's not like you were a complete rookie, but there's always that tension in life, right? When you're stepping in to fill in someone else's shoes, to, how do you be yourself and, and put your own imprint on it? Well, I think, you know, the reason Johnny Carson was successful is he was a, himself. Uh, Dick Cavett, any successful talk show host or host in general, Dick Block, my mentor, always says all TV shows are the same until the person says hello. And if you like the way they say hello, you'll stick around. And if you don't, you won't. And so I can't teach somebody to be likable. But certainly I was uh, gifted in the fact that I was born in the Midwest. And for whatever reason, Dick Cavett, Midwest, Johnny Carson, Midwest, Mark Summers, Midwest, many of the successful hosts came from that part of the country, whether it was Iowa, Nebraska, Indiana, Ohio, you know, it, it for some reason made it happen. And all I can be is who I am. I never pretended to be anybody else. You know, when I was working in the comedy store and, and Robin Williams took off, all of a sudden there were 10 versions of Robin Williams. And when Letterman took off, there were 10 versions of Letterman. And the one thing I learned is if there's already a Robin Williams, why do I need another one? You need to be who you are and create your own brand, so to speak, although that term wasn't being used back in 76 when they started at the store. Um, but I, I think unless you are true to who you really are and try to quote, impersonate somebody else, it's never going to work. And you and Letterman, both from Indiana, and so you're both doing warm up. What did you learn from those other guys observing, you know, Letterman observing Saget uh, during that time period? Well, um, Saget did more humor. He played guitar. He was funny as hell. Uh, always was very good. Not my style. I'm folksy. Letterman is folksy. So I got to know the people. I asked about their families and what they did. And I had I did magic up there and I had some games that I played. But I was just basically who I was and pretended I was in somebody's living room trying to entertain them. And that's what worked for me. Once again, um, if I tried to be something that I, that I wasn't, if I tried to jump all over the stage and be like Robin, it would have never worked because people would know instantaneously that's not who I was. So, you know, I started doing magic shows when I was 11, 12 years old back in Indiana. I was on a kid's TV show called Popeye and Janie. And by the time I hit Boston where I went to college, I had a certain amount of performing experience. I was working coffee houses. It was the early 70s uh, back in Boston. And then when it came to Los Angeles, became a regular at the comedy store in the Magic Castle. So, you know, the more experience you get, the better you get. And, you know, people say to me, well, I want to be a host. How do I do that? I said, well, you got to figure out how to get in front of an audience and, and work on your craft. You just don't automatically get the job hosting The Tonight Show. You got to build up to it. And a lot of people don't want to work that hard. And therefore, you know, they're, they're never going to make it. Do you remember exactly how you got the Double Dare call? Oh, I tell you the whole double their story. It's fascinating. Um, I, I kind of had one foot out the door. I was trying, I was doing warm ups like crazy. I was making, you know, six figures, but I was miserable and I wanted to host. And they kept saying to me, I look too young. You know, at the time it was Jack Berry and Bob Eubanks and Gene Rayburn. And they said, I look like a boy scout. Come back when I have gray hair and wrinkles. <laughs> well, all of a sudden, you know, Nickelodeon takes off, but I didn't know what Nickelodeon was. So there was a guy, Dave Garrison, who was a ventriloquist back in Indiana when I was growing up and then he moved to Los Angeles and was starting to do, I was uh, hosting uh, open mic night at the improv on Monday nights and, and Dave used to come in there. And I get a phone call one day from Dave saying, Hey Mark, I got a phone call from some network I've never heard of called Nickelodeon and they're doing a game show. I don't even know what it's called. You know, I don't want to be in front of the camera anymore. I, I'm just not willing to work that hard to be talent. I'm going to move behind the scenes and become a producer. So why don't you go to this audition instead of me? So I went, and when they called Dave Garrison's name, I said, Dave's not here, but my name is Mark. Can I audition instead? They said, sure, which I don't think you could even do that today either. Yeah. Right. Well, I did the audition, and it went really well. I got three callbacks. Now, I started auditioning in July. So I had a callback in July, one in August, and I knew they were going to start shooting in Philadelphia the first week of September. So I always took the name down of the exec producer and the casting agent when I went into these auditions. And I didn't hear from them. And I was curious because I thought I did a damn good job. So I called Mike Klinghoffer, who was exec producer. And I said, hey, you know, I haven't heard from you guys. I did those three callbacks. Are you still looking to find a host for Double Dare? And he said, you know what? It's funny you called. We were just discussing that. We like you and one other guy, but we can't figure out which one of you to hire. And I said, well, what's the issue? Well, when we did the auditions, there were grownups playing the part of kids. So we never really worked with kids. And we said, well, we don't know if you're good with kids or not. And I said, well, I have two kids. He said, well, that's not good enough. And I said, well, I was a magician for kids' parties. He said, that's not good enough. So I said, why don't you fly me and whoever this other person is to New York, put us in a studio with kids, do the show, and let the best person win. 
He said, I'll call you back in an hour. So he called me back in an hour. He said, what are you doing over Labor Day? And I said, coming to New York and doing the audition? He said, yes. So they flew me and whoever this other person was. To this day, I don't know who it was. We went in and both did the auditions. I went first. I left the stage. They wouldn't let me see who it was. He came in and did it. That was on a Monday. On Wednesday at 10 o'clock in the morning, my phone rings. It's Mike Klinghoffer. He said, congratulations. You're the host of Double Dare. I said, can I ask you a question? You auditioned 1,000 people in New York, and you tell me 1,000 people in L.A., why did I get the job? And he said, quite honestly, the two of you were about the same. But at the end of his audition, he looked in the camera and said, is that it? Or do you guys want me to do something else? And I looked in the camera and I said, we'll be back with more Double Dare right after this. And because I threw the commercial, they thought that was more professional. It changed my life. Wow. That one thing. That's amazing. That's yep. amazing. But it goes back to what you're saying about being prepared, right? Like yeah. you, you were prepared. You had experience. You'd, you'd put, put in the time. I had been writing game shows, certainly watching them since I was a kid. And, uh, you know, but if I would have gotten that, I was 33 when I got that audition. If I was 23, I would have never gotten it because I wasn't seasoned right. enough. Right, right. Do you know, did you, did you sense that you were going to be onto something big? Did, what did you sense no. with Double Dare? No, I, I thought we'll, deal, we'll do uh, 65 of these and I'll go home and never do it again, uh, which is the way I've looked at every show. You know, the fact that we're doing these and anybody would watch is, you know, mind boggling to me. So, uh the first day was miserable. It took us, you know, eight hours to shoot one episode and it was just a freaking nightmare. And uh, I just thought, well, you know, this ain't going anywhere. But each day it got better and better and better. And to the point we were in about episode 40 and I looked at the team and I went, you know, I think we're onto something here. Well, when it hit the airwaves, Nickelodeon had done homework and found out that kids didn't have their own game show. They were living vicariously through their parents watching Price and Wheel and Jeopardy and stuff like that. And so all of a sudden we became, as they used to refer to us as my show, and it was something called Playground Talk. Not everybody had cable back in 1986. So kids would go and tell other kids on the playground, hey, I saw this show where people jumped into 5,000 pounds of baked beans and then won a computer. You know, what's a computer? They didn't even know because, you know, we were the first ones to give the Apple uh, computers away. And word of mouth carried us through. And all of a sudden we were doing uh, shopping centers where we were drawing 5,000 people. Then all of a sudden we were doing malls where we're drawing, or I'm sorry, uh, theaters where we're drawing 15 or 20,000 people. And uh, it became a phenomenon. That's so cool. Um, I want to flash forward to your association with Food Network for many years. And even your son has done work with my brother. It's funny, we were, <laughs> we were connecting the dots. Turns out my brother, Andrew, and your son have worked together, uh, which is really cool on some Food Network shows. So how did that association come about? Did, was it the baked beans connection that the, you know, the network was like, okay, we got to have this guy. I used to throw things food at people. And now all of a sudden I was talking about the history of it. <laughs> um, no, that was a mistake as well. Uh, for some reason, people have always thought I was a producer. Why? I have no idea. And so I used to get ideas pitched to me all the time. And I wasn't really interested in being a producer, but you know, if I thought a show was a good idea and I had a lot of connections, I would set up meetings. So I was doing a, a talk show on Lifetime called Our Home. And, um, we had a woman on her name is Roseanne Gold, who was a chef, had uh, written uh, a book called Recipes 123, won a James Beard Award. And she was a regular on my show and I loved her. <clears throat> and so she had another concept based on the Recipes 123 James Beard Award winning book. So I made a meeting at Food Network. And all the time I was pitching Roseanne, who was sitting right next to me, they kept saying, well, why don't you do a show for us? Well, why don't you do a show for us? I kept saying, well, why the hell would I do? I don't even cook. And I was talking about, it. well, somebody at Food Network had done their homework and realized I had this following from the Nickelodeon days who all got older and now were somewhat following to wherever I went. They were following me to Lifetime and they thought, well, we're a fledgling network network here. Maybe we can get Summers to draw an audience here as well. And what year was this? So this was, was very uh, early. 1999. So very early in the Food Network days? Real early. Really? Okay. And um, That's kind of your forte, early in a network. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Help build it. And so uh, they offered me a job. Uh, the show was called It's a Surprise. It was about surprise parties. The surprise was nobody was watching. Uh, <laughs> it was a horrible show. Um, but I was doing a special for them. Um, the, let's say it was called the National Team Pastry Championship, somewhere in some mountain town in uh, Colorado. And they gave me um, a special they had done called Unwrapped. And the host was Mark Silverstein, who was hosting another show on, uh, on Food Network. And they said, would you think about hosting the show as a regular, like once a week deal? And I looked at the pilot uh, of the special and I said, you know, I think uh, what biography was to A&E back in the day when everybody was watching that, I said, this could be same thing for Food Network. And so we shot uh, 13 of them, I believe. 
And they put us on Monday nights at 1030. We were dying after the first three weeks. And the president of the channel called me and said, you're killing me. But uh, I'm going to move you to nine o'clock on Monday nights. And if you do well, great. Otherwise, you're fired. They put us on Monday nights at nine o'clock. The audience exploded. Next thing I know, we're on from nine to 10. Then we're doing a game show called Trivia Unwrapped. And it was 90 minutes. Uh, Mark Summers on Monday night. It was all Mark all the time. <laughs> and um, I explained to the network that I didn't want to watch 90 minutes of Mark Summers, nor that I think anybody should be subjected to that. Um, <laughs> and the game show didn't work particularly well. And uh, that was fine. But uh, we shot, God knows, hundreds of episodes of Unwrapped. Um, and that was one of the best jobs I've ever had. And then from there, I did other shows. I was the first uh, host for the couple of years of uh, Next Food Network Star. I was there to help crown uh, Guy Fieri when he won. And, uh, you know, then did Dinner Impossible, Restaurant Impossible, and been at Food Network. Uh, I was there for 20 years. Wow. What was the relationship like with the, obviously you must have had some kind of good relationship with the, the powers that be there. I did. You know, uh, Judy Gerard, who was the first person who hired me, i tell you what a great relationship I had with her. I get a phone call one day and she and the message was, you need to call me. And I thought, oh my God, when I hear you need to call me, uh, that makes me nervous. So I picked up the phone and said, Judy, is everything all right? She said, yeah, I just want to tell you something. I'm leaving the channel and uh, I tore up your contract. So call your agent. I said, what do you mean you tore up my contract? She said, just call your agent. She knew she was leaving. I had another year on my contract. Judy gave me an additional three years for an exorbitant raise. Uh, and it was because of the relationship. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you where that relationship came from. I was hosting a show on Lifetime called uh, Biggers and Summers. It was a talk show. And uh, also, we did six months of it. didn't work. So Judy came in. She was head of programming at Lifetime at the time and um, fired us. And so I said to her, um, can I have access to an edit room? And she said, why? And I said, well, I need a job. I need to go in there and make a new sizzle reel. So if you'll let me take uh, some of the clips and use your editor, uh, it'll save me a fortune. And then I can use it to go out and try and find the next job. And she said, wow, uh, I'm surprised that you're not more upset. I said, well, I am upset, Judy, but what am I supposed to do? Scream and yell and jump up and down? You, you decided the show wasn't working. You fired me. Anything I say isn't going to change that. So let's just move on. And then I wrote her a, a note thanking her for giving me the opportunity. Well, our relationship was, was bonded and merged in such a great way at that time that when she moved to another network and hired me, uh, she trusted me and gave me a huge raise based on the relationship. So relationships are key no matter where you go. And you never know when those relationships begin and where they're going to extend to because in show business, nobody's anywhere for longer than three years. They go from network to production company to God knows where. And you want to make sure that when they go to that new place and you're looking for a job, you didn't leave on bad terms. And and perfect example is that is your relationship with the Mark Maxwell Smith, who calls you up to, you know, he sells a show to DreamWorks early on in DreamWorks history and brings in his trusted old friend to be a host of it. What, what was that like when he called you up and said, I got a project for you, Mark? Well, but I had to audition. I went through a lot of auditions. And um, it, it was it was torture. But I got to tell you, I would have never gotten that job if it wasn't Mark. He was the one who kept pushing. There were other people there who weren't so sure. But he's the one who said, he's my guy. I think he's the person who can pull it off. And because he gave me that support, he was able to convince a room full of, you know, Spielbergs, Katzenbergs and whoever. And it worked out. And, you know, Mark Smith is my first friend in Los Angeles. I was a page on Joker's Wild, I saw him running around like a crazy man. I went up and introduced <laughs> myself. And that was in 1974. So 84, yeah. 94, 204, 214. I've known Mark 46 years. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Great friendship. Um, you know, one of the things that strikes me about you is how you don't take setbacks. You don't, you, you are constantly taking initiative. You're hustling. You're not going to wait for something to come to you. You're not going to sit at home waiting for the phone to ring. Do you think that that's something that you were just born with? Is that something you had to learn? How did you become that way? Uh, I lecture at colleges and my opening line is nobody got up this morning and said, I got to go find Mark Summers a job today. Mm -hmm. uh, nobody cares about Mark Summers. Uh, the only person responsible for my career and my life and my happiness is me. Uh, I've never had an agent ever get me a job. Uh, I've got my own jobs because I knew how to make phone calls and build relationships. They've made uh, the deals, which I don't do. But they've never gotten a job. And I go back to when I was a kid and I used to live on talk shows, Mike Douglas, Merv Griffin, Johnny Carson, whoever had a talk show I was watching. And Merv Griffin was doing an hour with Bob Hope. 
And at the end of the hour, we said, I have one final question, Bob. If you had to point to one person who made your career, who would it be? And Hope pointed to himself and said, me. I'm the one who made it happen. And yes, there have been occasional people. I mean, the Mark Maxwell Smith thing is magical and doesn't happen often. But 92% of everything that's happened in my career, I did on my own. Mm. Um, I, I can't leave this interview without asking you about the Burt Reynolds Tonight Show episode. <laughs> For those who haven't seen it, I will embed it in the post so you can watch it. Uh, tell me a little bit about what was going through your head as it unfolded. Did Was this something that was a setup you guys planned beforehand? No. Okay. All right. Let me tell you what happened. You know, from the time I was a kid, I wanted to be on the Tonight Show. I wanted to be on with Johnny, needless to say, but unfortunately that didn't happen. I kept auditioning when I was doing stand-up. They never thought I was good enough. So, you know, great. Um, when I became uh, the host of, like, I think I was doing four different shows. I was doing uh, Double Dare and What Would You Do and my Lifetime show. And I had a syndicated show called Pick Your Brain. And so I was like hosting four shows. And my publicist at the time handled a bunch of people and they wanted Jason Alexander. Uh, Seinfeld was just being canceled or uh, stopping. They were never canceled. They quit on their own accord. But um, And they wanted Jason Alexander to be a regular on The Tonight Show. So my publicist said, oh, if you want him, I need you to talk to Mark Summers and see if you can get him on the show. So they promised me to be on the show for a year. And I kept getting bumped, as they said. They booked me and unbooked me and booked me and unbooked me. And I Were you down at the studio? No, they would call okay. me the day before and say, yeah. change of plans, change okay. of plans. You know, you wonder after a year, was I just being jerked around or was I really going to do the show? So I get a phone call. Guess what? Uh, you're on. No matter what, we're not going to cancel. Fantastic. So the car, the limo comes and picks me up at my house at the time at Calabasas. And uh, as we're going on the Ventura Freeway, it gets a flat tire. It's like, you know, <laughs> not, meant to, be, you not know? meant to be, no. So I get there 50 minutes before showtime. You know, Jay comes into my dressing room. I'm sorry, what happened? And I'm booking and the other thing. And I'm back here. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks, Jay. And so um, uh, Burt Reynolds was going through a divorce with Lonnie Anderson and was on this book tour and uh, was in a surly mood. It was in a and funk. <laughs> oh, my God, it was unbelievable. And Jay, in fact, made some comments about him the night before, which I guess Reynolds was watching wasn't too happy. Uh, so um, he says some really funny, but I guess biting things to, to Bert. And when Bert came out to do a segment, he was pissy. In fact, he had a pair of scissors and he came out and cut Jay's tie off. Well, that blew me away because one of the things I was going to do was a magic trick. I was going to do cut and restore tie. Now all of a sudden, Jay's oh, not the tie. What the hell am I supposed to do? So like this yeah. is a major disaster going on. Oh, and I'm man. facing back in the green room going, now what the hell do we do? And uh, he was supposed to do Did, did Bert know about that? Do you think he did no, that intentionally? No. no. Okay. It was okay, one of these okay. weird, uh, it was the strangest night of my weird life. Coincidence. Yeah. And, um, but he was that pissed. So uh, I'm in the green room and Bert's supposed to do two segments. Then I'm supposed to do the third, and then Carrot Top, the comedian, is supposed to be on fourth. Well, Bert's doing so well in sort of a strange way that he did three segments. Now they have to come backstage and bump one of us. And they were getting ready to bump me. And my publicist mm. said, if you bump Summers one more time, Jason Alexander will never do the show as long as I live. And so they wanted Jason that much, so they told Carrot Top to you know, come back tomorrow, mm -hmm. and they put me on. And uh, so I came out and started to talk. And Jay was asking me about Double Dare and this and that. And uh, we was, he was asking me about uh, being a neatness fanatic. I talked about that part of my life. And uh, Bert says, you know, who said you were a neatness fanatic? And he kept heckling me during the, the, yeah. the prelude to this. You did story. not get far into it before he started giving you trouble. Started yeah. to just drive me nuts. And I said, my wife told me, and by the way, Bert, I'm still married. Well, <laughs> one of those, whoa, kind of thing. he had a glass of water in his hand. He poured it in my crotch. Okay. Yeah. Now, if everybody says this, this was planned. Trust me. This was not set up. First of all, I'm not that good of an actor. And no, <laughs> it wasn't set up at all. So I went to get a, a, a glass of water to pour back on him. He straight armed me and the cup, the porcelain cup hit me in my face. I Ooh. thought he had dipped a tooth. Okay. Uh, and that was all real. I mean, he was, he was angry and he yeah. pushed me hard. And, uh, you know, yeah, I, you know, by the way, you can't tell from the video that you got angry. You were seemed unflappable. Well, you know, I was a stand up comic and I had had hecklers and I looked at him as a heckler and he wasn't yeah. going to take my space. I waited too damn long to get there. And eventually uh, there was another cup in front of me and I poured it on him. Uh, and the audience, which you don't see because the audience was turned around, gave me a standing ovation when mm. I poured that water mm. on him because they were now saying, yeah. you know, what the hell? Why is he attacking this, you know, nice guy who does these kid shows? And it and ended up in this massive pie fight. Uh, and people say, well, where the hell did the pies come from? Well, at the time, Letterman was beating Jay hands down. And um, they thought, well, let's do a pie fight. And Jay said, 
I don't want to do that kind of humor to get, get an audience. So they put the props away. But when he saw that Bert and I were going to each other, there's, if you go back and look at the tape, you see Jay looking in the camera and saying, get the pies. Okay. Uh, uh-huh. So I saw, I didn't know what that meant. And the prop guy ran behind backstage and came back all of a sudden with some cans of whipped cream and some pies. And we went, you know, back to back and, and did a pie fight. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so the next day, the headline in the New York Post says, Bert goes berserk on tonight. You know, I'm on entertainment tonight and every other show and people are saying, you know, what the hell happened? And I didn't even know. In fact, uh, you know, he, he says to me during the commercial break, he had his book there that he was pushing. And he leans over to me and says, what's your broad's name? I said, excuse me. I, uh, he said, what's your broad's name? I said, my wife. He goes, yeah, your wife. And he, you know, uh, did a subscript uh, uh, inscription to me, you know, dear Mark, whatever. I have the book in the garage somewhere. I haven't looked at it. But, um, but anyway, uh, and then the next day he talked to a friend of mine who said that I was a bottom feeder of show business and I didn't, didn't give the movie star any respect. So, um, you know, it was a changing point in my career to this day. I think it was 1994 when that happened. There, there's probably not a week that goes by where somebody doesn't ask me about, was it set up? Did it really happen? Yeah. Uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. And it was the crazy stuff. And that was the first night that Jay actually tied Dave in the ratings. So it wow. was for him. Yeah. Wow. Wow. What a great story. Wow. Yeah. What a crazy story. Um, well, yeah, I know you have some, some, uh, other projects you're working on now. You've got, there's a new, there's a discovery streaming channel and you've got a couple of shows that are coming up with that. Tell us a little about those. Yeah. Discovery plus is launching January 4th. And, um, I did, I have a partner, uh, Ian Shive. And if you look up Ian Shive, he is one of the best photographers in the world. And, uh, he's the official photographer for the national park service. A couple of years back, we got discovery into, um, Cuba, and we did a shark special in Cuba uh, that was uh, so much fun. And uh, we got together again and started to put some projects together. And we have two that are going to be launching. Uh, one's digital already called uh, Nature in Focus. But uh, the one that's launching on Discovery Plus is called uh, The Last Frontier. And uh, we went to some uh, islands up near um, Russia that have not been inhabited in hundreds of years. And it's more of a science of nature uh, about seals and birds and how man affects them in the environment. And uh, it's quite fascinating. And we hope to get a chance to uh, tune in and see that. You know, I've gone from, you know, doing magic to stand-up comedy to warm-ups uh, to throwing green liquids at 11-year-olds to talking about the history of food. And now I'm doing science and nature. So it's been quite an interesting career. It's fun to do, you know, to explore new dimensions, new elements, new formats. Streaming, that's, a, you know, the thing now these days. Seems to be. Yeah. Well, maybe that'll be your new network that you build up this the, uh, dis- discovery streaming. Uh, Mark, this has been such a pleasure to reconnect with you and to kind of go through some of these different highlights. Um, where can people go learn more about you, connect with you, uh, you know, follow uh, your work? Uh, MarkSummersTV.com is my website uh, in, you know, the real Mark Summers on Instagram and uh, all those other Facebook and Twitter and all that kind of good stuff. And love to hear what people have to say and, What's uh, going on in their minds? I'm also on Cameo. I kinda, that's another crazy thing. You know, they kept asking me to do it. I kept saying no. They finally convinced me. And uh, that's, I, mean, I like, I did 16 Cameos last week. I did two. Yeah. I mean, it's just fun to sort of that's interact, uh, you know, with fans. You know, I'm wishing them happy birthday, uh, happy anniversary, Merry Christmas, happy Hanukkah, you name it. Uh, so, you know, if you're so inclined and you want me to wish you something or say something to uh, a member of your family or your office, Hey, I'm doing that too. I think that's awesome that you're doing that because you know that made someone's week, month, year, you know, they they tell all their friends about it, you know. I think it goes to, you know, goes to why you've had a long career in, in show business is because you're willing to do that sort of thing. Well, you know, the comments that people make, like I went this morning and said, you know, coolest, my dad said it's the greatest gift I ever got. Her father had been on a show I used to host called History IQ uh, for History Channel back in the day. And uh, so I actually did a little quiz show with him where I asked him five questions about presidents. And so, okay. you know, I'm, just, I'm having fun. What the hell? You know, I mean, That's awesome. in these COVID times, you can't leave your house. So you right. may as well be able to entertain, you know, yourself and uh, half right. of America uh, fr- from the uh, luxury of your bedroom, your office. Your bedroom. <laughs> right. That's what I'm doing. That's super cool. Mark, it's been a pleasure. Thanks so much. John, thank you. Be well. Thank you for listening to the Smart Business Revolution podcast with John Corcoran. 
Find out more at smartbusinessrevolution.com. And while you're there, sign up for our email list and join the revolution. 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 And be listening for the next episode of the Smart Business Revolution podcast.